The Bible Belt Strangler The Bible Belt Strangler, which is probably not the best person to meet at church, was an unidentified serial killer active in the late 1970s to early 1980s. This mysterious figure targeted young women and girls across several states in the Bible Belt, a region known for its conservative values and a whole lot of churches. But instead of spreading God's word, this guy was spreading terror. His mode of killing was more hands-on because he chose strangulation and then dumped their bodies along highways in states like Tennessee and Kentucky. Now, you'd think a guy going around strangling people in broad daylight would get caught pretty quick, right? But nope, the Bible Belt Strangler managed to stay off the radar. Part of the problem was the time period because the victims' bodies were often found months after they had disappeared, and DNA testing was not even a thing then. The worst part is the police in the different states were never ready to share information either. It was like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle, but half the pieces were in a different box. Plus, the killer was really sneaky with his attacks. He'd strike in one state, then disappear only to pop up again miles away. Law enforcement agencies struggled to connect the dots, and by the time they did, the killer was long gone, probably cruising down another highway, blending in with all the other travelers. The Alphabet Killer the Alphabet Killer earned this creepy nickname because of his peculiar choice in victims. You see, all the victims were young girls whose first and last names started with the same letter, hence the alphabet part. It's like he had a thing for alliteration, but in the most horrifying way possible. For example, Carmen Colon, age 10, was found murdered in 1971. Her body was discovered in Churchville, New York. Wanda Welkowitz, age 11, was killed in 1973 with her body found in Webster, New York. And Michelle Mainza, age 11, was also murdered in 1973 with her body discovered in Macedon, New York. Notice something? All the girls' first and last names start with the same letter and their bodies were found in towns that began with the same letter as their names. It's like the killer was playing a sick game of Scrabble, but instead of scoring points, he was taking lives. The Rochester police were baffled by the case because not only was the killer targeting young girls with matching initials, but he also managed to avoid leaving any solid evidence behind. The case drew nationwide attention and the FBI was brought in to help crack the code. But the alphabet killer was as elusive as a shadow at night. The police had a few suspects, but none of them panned out. One of the most notable suspects was Kenneth Bianchi, who later became infamous as one of the hillside stranglers in Los Angeles. But there wasn't enough evidence to link him to the alphabet murders, and he was never charged for those crimes. The Rainbow Maniac Back in 2007 to 2008, the Paturas Park in Carapicuiba, a suburb of Sao Paulo, became the hunting ground for a serial killer who targeted gay men. He was dubbed the Rainbow Maniac because his victims were members of the LGBTQ community and, well, rainbows are the international symbol of pride. If only this guy had decided to embrace the rainbow instead of, you know, embodying the dark storm clouds of humanity. The Rainbow Maniac is believed to have murdered at least 13 men, and he had a particular M.O. He lured his victims into the park, a place that was known as a meeting spot for gay men under the guise of a romantic evening. But instead of a nice stroll or a charming chat, he would shoot them, usually in the head execution style. Talk about a date night that really went south. He would even strip his victims of their clothes before or after the killing, possibly as a way to further humiliate them. This was one predator who didn't just cross the line, he jumped over it and kept running. Unfortunately, the maniac was never arrested by the police, even though they have a potential suspect which was a retired police officer, no less. And despite all the evidence, including witness testimonies, the court acquitted him due to a lack of conclusive proof. Yeah, right. This was one of those times when justice seemed to take a vacation, and not a fun tropical one. The Paraquat Murderer If you were taking a casual stroll in Japan during the early 1980s and decided to stop for a drink at any vending machine, the chances of you ingesting poison instead of soda were very, very high. This was because the Paraquat murderer, a sinister madman, would literally leave poisoned drinks in vending machines around Japan. Unsuspecting victims would grab a drink, take a sip, and that would be the beginning of the end for them. The most diabolical part of his crimes was the fact that he used Paraquat, a highly toxic herbicide used primarily to kill weeds. When ingested by humans, it causes a painful and gruesome death, leading to respiratory failure as the lungs literally fill with fluid. 
Also, vending machines were as popular in Japan as sushi and samurais, making them the perfect place to execute a twisted plan. He managed to kill at least 12 people and severely injure the internal organs of 35 people. Despite the panic and intense police investigation, the Paraquat murderer was never caught. The case remains unsolved to this day, which is unsettling when you think about it. Also, the fact that he didn't even have a particular group of targets made his attacks very random and elusive, so anyone could have fallen victim to the poison drinks. The Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murderer If you thought hitchhiking was just about catching a free ride, well, think again, because in the early 1970s, hitchhiking in Santa Rosa, California was less about adventure and more like playing a deadly game of hide-and-seek, but the only one hiding was the killer and seeking, well, that didn't go so well. Between 1972 and 1973, a series of gruesome murders shocked the quiet town of Santa Rosa, and the victims were mostly young women who had been hitchhiking, trying to get from one place to another. But instead of getting a lift, they got a one-way ticket to their demise. The bodies of at least seven women were found dumped in rural areas around Santa Rosa, often in ravines or ditches, as if the killer was trying to sweep his crimes under the proverbial rug, or in this case, under some dirt and leaves. The victims ranged in age from 12 to 23, and they all had one thing in common. They were last seen hitchhiking before they vanished. Now, the exact details of how the killer subdued and murdered his victims aren't fully known, but the bodies showed signs of physical trauma, and some were found naked or partially clothed, suggesting a possible sexual motive. By the time the bodies were found, crucial evidence was lost and witnesses were few and far between. Plus, the remote locations where the bodies were dumped made it difficult to gather any physical evidence. The Butcher of Mons For this particular serial killer, the brutality of his crimes and the disturbing surgical skill that went into dismembering the bodies of his victims made it so much worse. It all started in the late 1990s in the small Belgian town of Mons. The dismembered body parts of several women were found scattered in garbage bags across the region. Some were dumped in rivers, others left by roadsides, and all were left like sinister breadcrumbs leading to nowhere. The victims, five women in total, were all brutally dismembered after death, earning the unknown killer the chilling nickname, the Butcher of Mons. And when we say dismembered, we are talking about a level of precision that suggests this wasn't the work of someone who just got a set of knives and a grudge for Christmas. No, this was someone who knew what they were doing. Someone who took their time and treated the whole thing like a macabre art project. Think of it as DIY, but with a terrifying twist. If you're the unfortunate victim, he would abduct you, do the most ansu thing to you, and then after you die, he would then cut you up into pieces and dump your body in trash bags around town. The case was never solved and the evil killer was never caught through the best efforts of the Belgian police. He left no fingerprints, no DNA, and most especially, no witnesses. It's as if he was a ghost, leaving only terror and confusion in his wake. Bible John If you thought quoting the Bible was reserved for Sunday sermons and overzealous door-to-door -door evangelists, well, think again, because in the late 1960s, a certain madman turned the streets of Glasgow into his own twisted pulpit. Between 1968 and 1969, while Glasgow was grooving to the tunes of the jive and jazz, a sinister killer was busy unaliving Patricia Docker, Jemima McDonald, and Helen Puddock, who went out to party. So basically, Bible John would approach the women at the Barrowland Ballroom during the venue's infamous dance nights. After some dancing and probably awkward Bible banter, he'd often to accompany them home. Chivalry, right? Except in this case, chivalry was dead, and soon so were his victims. All three women were found strangled with their stockings, a grim signature that tied the murders together. Additionally, there were signs of sexual assault, and the bodies were left in various parts of Glasgow. One chilling detail was that one of his victim's sisters, Jean, actually shared a taxi with Helen and Bible John on the night of Helen's murder. Jean recalled that the man had called himself John and talked about his strict upbringing while quoting the Bible extensively. He even complained about dance halls being dens of iniquity. Which is pretty ironic, considering the fact that he seemed more than happy to partake in the so-called iniquity before committing his heinous acts. 
talk about preaching water and drinking wine, or in this case, blood, the police launched one of the most extensive manhunts in Scottish history. Over 100 detectives were assigned to the case, and more than 50,000 witness statements were taken. They even created a composite sketch based on Jean's description, leading to a face that became infamous across Scotland. But for some really fucked up reason, the guy was never caught. Some speculate that he may have skipped town. The West Mesa Bone Collector Back in 2009, a woman walking her dog in the West Mesa area of Albuquerque, New Mexico made a gruesome discovery. Human bones sticking out of the desert ground. We're not talking about some ancient fossils here, these were relatively recent remains. When authorities started digging both literally and figuratively, they uncovered the bodies of 11 women and one unborn fetus. All the victims all went missing between 2001 and 2005. The media quickly dubbed the unknown perpetrator the West Mesa Bone Collector, a name that sounds more like a rejected superhero villain than a serial killer. The West Mesa Bone Collector targeted women who were already marginalized and vulnerable because all of the victims had connections to sex work and drug addiction, which sadly made them easier targets in the eyes of this predator. It's as if he took the saying, out of sight, out of mind, way too seriously, and by targeting women who were less likely to be reported missing or to have large support networks, he ensured that his crimes would fly under the radar for years. The worst part is that since the bodies were discovered long after the murders took place, much of the physical evidence was lost to time, the elements, and a general lack of solid clues. Although the police had a few leads, there was nothing solid enough to make an arrest. Unfortunately, we live in a society where a lot of wrongs go unpunished, but if you want to stay ahead and on top of all the important details, you can start by joining our Discord server now. The Servant Girl Annihilator Well, you probably didn't have to worry about this particular psycho if you were not a servant girl in Austin, Texas back in 1884. This is because this villain had a particular taste for, well, servant girls, and he wasn't exactly subtle either. He targeted young women who worked as domestic servants, often sneaking into their homes at night while they were sleeping. Talk about not respecting personal space. The Annihilator had a signature style, if you can call bludgeoning and stabbing people a style. He was like the horror movie version of a DIY enthusiast, with his weapon of choice being anything he could find, an axe, a knife, or even a heavy brick. This guy would have been a nightmare on a shopping spree at Home Depot. One by one, he attacked his victims in their homes, sometimes dragging them outside to finish the grisly work, and sadly killed up to eight girls. Well, it's not really a wonder that he wasn't caught, because the 1880s wasn't exactly the golden age of forensic science. Picture detectives back then with magnifying glasses and no clue about DNA, fingerprints, or even decent mustache grooming. Plus, the Annihilator was good at covering his tracks. He struck in the dead of night and always vanished before anyone could raise the alarm. Charlie Chopoff It's New York City, 1972, and jazz and music ruled the day, but amidst all the groovy vibes, a shadowy figure was targeting young African-American boys in the city's Harlem and Upper Manhattan neighborhoods. This wasn't just any random attacker. Charlie Chopoff had a horrifying M.O. that involved assaulting and tragically mutilating his victims. He wasn't exactly a subtle guy, his brutal attacks were marked by a horrific pattern. He would stab his victims repeatedly and then mutilate their bodies. It's no wonder the police and media quickly dubbed him Charlie Chopov, a nickname that probably made everyone want to lock their doors and hug their kids a little tighter. Charlie Chopov's victims were all young boys, all between the ages of 8 and 10. He lured them with promises of money or candy, proving that even in the 70s, stranger danger was a serious issue. Unfortunately, his brutal attacks left a trail of fear across the city, with only one survivor who was able to give a description of the attacker. However, in 1974, police arrested a man named Erno Soto who had been institutionalized for mental illness and fit the description provided by the survivor. Soto even confessed to one of the murders, but the confession was inconsistent and doubts lingered about whether he was actually the killer. The police held on to Soto as their main suspect, but with no solid evidence, the case eventually went cold. It was like trying to catch water with a sieve. Nothing stuck. The Skid Row Stabber 
It's the late 1970s in Los Angeles. Disco is booming, bell bottoms are in, and somewhere in the notorious Skid Row neighborhood, there's a shadowy figure on the loose. Skid Row wasn't exactly Beverly Hills, but the grimy, gritty, poverty-stricken area of LA. As bad as they already had it in this neighborhood, a certain madman named the Skid Row Stabber decided it was the perfect time to make his debut. This figure started to wreak havoc between 1978 and 1979 and was responsible for the brutal stabbing deaths of at least 11 homeless men. Now, you might say that targeting homeless individuals was a low blow, but there was a lack of attention and no witnesses to his crimes. Also, the guy didn't exactly go for creativity points in his killing method because his weapon of choice was a knife. Simple, sharp, and, well, pointy. He would approach his victims, usually when they were alone, and brutally stab them multiple times to death. It was a cowardly tactic, like a bully picking on the weakest kids in the playground, but with far deadlier consequences. The attacks were sudden, swift, and unfortunately for the victims, fatal. This wasn't a killer who spent time planning elaborate schemes or setting up traps like in horror movies. No, he went straight to the point, quite literally. It was really difficult for the police to catch and apprehend the person behind these brutal stabbings because no one could predict where he would strike next or honestly what his motives were for targeting poor homeless people. The lack of reliable witnesses also made it difficult for the police to get a solid lead. Plus, many of the victims had little to no family connections or social ties, meaning that there weren't many people out there pushing for a thorough investigation. Vera Renzi When you're in a relationship, it's totally normal to feel a little jealous now and then, and maybe you can even get a bit possessive or tempted to sneak a peek at your partner's texts. But this particular psychopath named Vera Renzi took jealousy and possessiveness to a whole new level, like six feet under level. It's a classic case of if I can't have you, then nobody can. Vera's obsession with men started when she was very young. She lost her mother when she was just 13, and by the time she was 20, she was already married to an older, wealthy banker. Well, her new husband suddenly disappeared, and when people asked her about him, Vera just told them he left. She was probably saying the truth because he's left this dimension, but that's probably not what the neighbors were thinking. You see, Vera was very pretty, so getting another husband wasn't difficult at all. But within a few months, husband number two also disappeared faster than a pizza at a teenage sleepover. But the thing is, it wasn't just husbands disappearing, because every single one of Vera's lovers over the years also suddenly vanished into thin air. The truth came to light in 1936 when the wife of one of Vera's latest flames reported him missing. The police came knocking and Vera casually confessed to killing him. The police, thinking they'd be lucky to find one body, were in for a surprise when they found 35 coffins neatly stashed in her basement like some twisted Ikea collection. Inside those coffins were her two husbands, her son, and 32 of her lovers, whom she killed by poisoning their wine with arsenic because she suspected them of being unfaithful or simply growing tired of her. In her twisted mind, this was a way to ensure they would never leave her. She was sentenced to life in prison and died in her cell in 1960. Miyuki Ishikawa If you were one of the Japanese babies delivered by the midwife Miyuki Ishikawa in the late 1940s and happened to make it out alive, it probably means that your parents desperately needed a child or that they were wealthy. You see, Miyuki was supposed to be a beacon of hope, ushering new life into the world, but instead of seeing her job as a sacred duty of care, she saw it as a burden. And if you were a baby born to a poor family, Miyuki figured it was better to help you skip the whole life part altogether. The simple yet horrific method she used in killing these babies was by neglecting them. As the senior midwife at the Kotobuki Maternity Hospital in Tokyo, she would deliberately not provide care, food, or warmth for these babies till they died. In her twisted head, she was sparing them from a life of poverty. The craziest part is that her husband and a doctor from the hospital were her accomplices because they helped her cover up the deaths. Sometimes, they would even make a profit from killing the babies because some desperate families who cannot afford the means to care for another child would deliberately accept Miyuki's deadly solution. The horrific scale of her crimes came to light in 1948 when two police officers discovered the remains of numerous infants. Further investigation revealed that that Miyuki killed about 103 babies. When she was finally brought to trial, the serial baby killer received just eight years in prison, which was even later reduced to four after an appeal. 
a joke. Juana Barraza. If you had a grandmother living in New Mexico from 1990 to 2006, she would probably be on a security detail that rivals the President of the United States and a personal bodyguard that would follow her wherever she goes. Because Juana Barraza was on the prowl targeting lonely elderly women and delivering a death grip far more lethal than anything she had ever used in the wrestling ring. This retired professional wrestler turns notorious serial killer would pose as a nurse, social worker, or someone offering assistance to gain the trust of older women who live alone. Once inside their home, she would channel the same strength she once used in the wrestling ring to strangle her victim to death with her bare hands, stockings, or telephone cords. Sadly, she managed to end the lives of 49 old women in this brutal way. After strangling her victims, she would rob them, taking whatever valuables she could find to keep herself going. This wasn't just a crime spree, it was a full-blown crime marathon and Juana was sprinting toward the finish line. The police, however, were looking for a male suspect, convinced that no woman could be behind such savage killings. Eventually, in 2006, she was caught red-handed fleeing the scene of her last murder. What drove Juana to such murderous madness? Well, it turns out she had some serious mommy issues. Her mother had been abusive and even sold her to an older man as a child. This deep-seated rage festered inside her and in her twisted mind, every elderly woman she strangled was a stand-in for the mother who betrayed her. Now she was convicted of 16 counts of murder and sentenced to 759 years in prison where she remains to date. Dorothea Puente. So it's 1982 and you start looking for the perfect home to put your sick dad for care and a friend tells you about this nice old woman called Dorothea Puente and her boarding house in Sacramento, California. Basically, Dorothea was an old woman who was offering free rooms to the elderly and mentally disabled individuals. But what you don't know is that her hospitality came with a sinister catch. This woman was basically killing people and burying them in her backyard and cashing in the victim's social security checks as a pastime hobby. Once you lodge as one of her guests, she would drug you with heavy doses of sleeping pills, then suffocate you. Most of the time, some people would even die from the drug overdose. Her scam show finally came to an end in 1988 when Alberto Montoya, a mentally disabled man who was living at Dorothea's boarding house, suddenly disappeared. His social worker got suspicious when Dorothea's excuses started piling up like uncollected rent checks, and the social worker filed a missing persons report. When the police showed up, they didn't suspect anything but saw Dorothea as a sweet old lady running a home for people in need. But when her story about Alberto's disappearance didn't add up, they decided to dig a little deeper, literally. A total of seven bodies were dug up from her backyard, one of which was Alberto's. The gruesome discovery led to her arrest, but Dorothea, being an ever crafty granny, tried to play it cool and even asked the officers if she could step outside for a moment. She used that opportunity to run away, but they caught up with her in Los Angeles a few days later. In 1993, Dorothea was convicted of three murders, though she suspected of at least nine and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Jane Topan. Jane Topan, affectionately known as Jolly Jane, was a nurse in the late 1800s who had a deadly fascination with the human body. Well, unlike most nurses, Jane preferred to see people dead rather than alive, and she took it upon herself to make it happen. Between 1895 and 1901, she used her position as a nurse to experiment on her patients, blending her medical knowledge with a twisted desire to play God. Jane's method was as chilling as it was calculated. She would administer her patients with a lethal cocktail of morphine and atropine that would push her victims to the brink of death and then pull them back only to repeat the process. She got a sick thrill from watching them suffer, taking pleasure in the moments when they hovered between life and death. Sometimes the sick woman would even have sex with her victims as they took their final breaths. For Jane, this wasn't just murder, it was a twisted form of intimacy. Over the years, Jane claimed the lives of at least 31 people, but her killing spree came came down in 1901 when the family of one of her victims demanded a toxicology report. The results show that the patient had been poisoned, leading to Jane's arrest. During her trial, Jane confessed to 31 murders and expressed a desire to have killed more people than anyone else in history. She was declared insane and committed to a mental institution for the rest of her life where she died in 1939. Bella Gunnis. These days, people use Tinder and such to find their partners and go on dates 
rights, but things were a little different in the 1880s. Then, if you wanted to find a husband or wife, you would have to place an ad in the Lonely Hearts newspaper to explain what you want and what you have to offer. Well, things took a really dark turn from 1884 to 1908, because a woman named Bella Gunness, who was fondly called the Black Widow of the Midwest, used the newspaper ads to lure unsuspecting males to her farm. It seems that her idea of happily ever after usually involved a shovel and a plot of land out back. She was like the praying mantises of the human world. Now, once you fell victim to her newspaper ad and came to her farm, she would drug you up until you're out cold, then strike you on the head with a blunt weapon or sometimes would just slit your throats. The crazy woman would then cut up your body into tiny pieces, feed some to her pigs, and bury the rest. Over the years, Bella is believed to have killed more than 40 people, but thankfully, everything came to a stop in 1908 when her farmhouse burned down under mysterious circumstances. Among the ruins, authorities discovered the bodies of her children, body parts of several men, and a headless corpse that was initially believed to be Belle herself. However, the size of the body didn't match Belle's physical stature, leading to suspicion that she had faked her own death to escape capture. Sadly, she did evade the capture. Nanny Doss If you were a man in the U.S. from the 1920s to the 1950s, and you happened to be charmed by a middle-aged woman with a sweet, seductive smile, there's a good chance you just met Nanny Doss. And if you were unlucky enough to marry her, well, let's just say you'd soon be six feet under, possibly with a belly full of poisoned pie. Nanny was married five times, and each husband died by her hand, but not before she had taken out hefty life insurance policies on them. Her weapon of choice was poison, which she would usually mix into food or drink. Crazy Nanny didn't stop at killing her husbands, though. She extended her deadly touch to her children, grandchildren, and even her own mother and sister. Clearly, Nanny believed in keeping things in the family, especially when it came to her poison supply. Thanks to her constantly smiling face and habit of giggling, which earned her the nickname Giggling Granny, she was never suspected of a thing until 1954 when she murdered her fifth husband, Samuel Doss. Apparently, Samuel Doss had been hospitalized with flu-like symptoms but recovered, only to drop dead as soon as he got home. An autopsy revealed enough arsenic in his system to kill five men. This new development opened up an investigation that led to the arrest of Nanny Doss. In total, she murdered about 11 people. During her confession, Nanny was disturbingly nonchalant, admitting to the murders with a smile on her face. In 1955, she was sentenced to a life in prison at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary, where she continued to be cheerful and unrepentant until she died on June 2nd, 1965. Beverly Allett Well, if you were not a young child admitted to the Grantham and Kestevan Hospital in England during the early 1990s, then you have nothing to worry about, because sadly, this is where this particular predator, disguised as a caring, attentive, and perfect caregiver for vulnerable children, decided to carry out her most horrible acts. You see, Beverly Allett would inject the children in her care with insulin or potassium, causing them to suffer from sudden, life-threatening conditions like cardiac arrest or hypoglycemia. In some cases, she went old school and smothered them with a pillow. And over just 59 days, she managed to kill four children and left nine others with severe, lifelong injuries. She was basically a one-woman wrecking crew in a nurse's uniform. The worst part was that the hospital didn't initially suspect that one of their own was behind these incidents. After all, who would ever imagine that a nurse, a person whose very job it is to care, would be the one causing such devastation. It wasn't until after several suspicious deaths and near-fatal incidents that the hospital began to investigate the pattern of sudden collapses, all occurring when Alet was on duty. This eventually led to her arrest, and then during her trial, she was diagnosed with Munchausen syndrome, a condition where a caregiver causes harm to those in their care to gain attention or sympathy. Want to find out more about how twisted the minds of some people are? Then join our Discord server today to get all the exciting updates. Updates. Rosemary West. Now, when a man and a woman meet up and start talking about marriage and family, you would think they were discussing matters concerning children or buying a house. Well, yes, but not for Rosemary West and her husband Fred West. This depraved couple during the 1970s and 1980s killed, brutally tortured, mutilated, and 
sexually assaulted at least 12 young women and girls, including their own daughter. Sadly, their victims were sometimes lodgers, while others were just abducted from the streets to be subjected to extreme cruelty and torture before being killed. Once you died, they would dismember and bury you in the cellar or garden of their home at 25 Cromwell Street, which became infamously known as the House of Horrors. Well, they were finally caught when their daughter Heather suddenly went missing. The police opened an investigation, found Heather's body buried in the garden, and, well, the bodies of the other poor victims. Rosemary and her husband were arrested, even though the man took the chicken way out by unaliving himself just before trial. Rosemary faced trial, however, and was convicted of 10 murders and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. She remains in prison to this day, one of the few women in the UK to be sentenced to a whole life order. Janine Jones. If you were sadly born in one of the hospitals where nurse Janine Jones worked, the chances of you reaching six months old were very, very slim. During the late 1970s and early 1980s, Janine would inject her young patients with drugs like digoxin, heparin, and succinylcholine, which are medications that can stop a heart or paralyze their lungs. After inducing these crises, Janine would often be the first on the scene, appearing to save the child in a sick attempt to play the hero and save the child. It's believed that she was driven by a condition known as hero syndrome. This psychological condition leads a person to create dangerous situations so they can save the victims, thereby gaining praise and recognition. Unfortunately, many of her victims did not survive these attempts, making her actions even more tragic. The truth began to surface in 1982 when the unusually high death rate among her young patients caught the attention of hospital staff at Bexar County Hospital in San Antonio. An investigation revealed that Janine was the common link in many of these cases. She was convicted in 1984 of murdering 15-month-old Chelsea McClellan by injecting her with a lethal dose of muscle relaxants and the attempted murder of four-week-old Rolando Santos. She was sentenced to 99 years in prison. In 2017, she was indicted on additional murder charges for the deaths of other children, bringing her total number of suspected victims to possibly over 60. Victor Manuel Garena. So, back in 1983, a man named Victor Manuel Garena decided he was done with the 9 to 5 grind at Wells Fargo, where he worked as a security guard. Instead of just quitting like a normal person, he interrogated two of his co-workers, roughed them up a little so they could give him the vault code, and then tied and injected them with a sedative. After this, he casually got the money and walked out of the front door with seven million dollars in cash. That's right, seven million bucks straight out of the vault. He had already made all the plans beforehand and mastered all the routines, plus working as a security guard gave him the best advantage. The guy never fired a single shot, like dude didn't even have to have a gun. Talk about being efficient. Garena pulled off the heist so smoothly that it almost sounded like an Ocean's Eleven subplot, but instead of heading to Vegas, he just went poof and disappeared. The FBI has been chasing him for over 40 years, and this guy has somehow managed to stay one step ahead. Some investigators say he fled to Cuba, where he's probably living his best escaped fugitive life ever since. Eugene Palmer While grandparents are sweet, they can also be particularly grumpy, but Eugene Palmer basically took grumpy old man to a whole new level and then ran for the hills. This guy is wanted by all the local authorities, and not for pulling off elaborate heists or masterminding massive crimes, Palmer's story is a little more family drama gone horribly wrong. So in 2012, Palmer, who was 73 at the time, got into a heated argument with his daughter-in-law, Tammy. Apparently, he didn't like how she was treating his son during their divorce. So instead of settling the dispute with passive-aggressive Facebook posts like a normal person, he decided to shoot her. That's right, Grandpa Eugene grabbed a shotgun and shot her dead in her own driveway. He took the phrase, don't mess with my family, a little too literally. After the murder, the old man took off into the woods near his property like he was starring in his own backwoods survival movie. Palmer was also an experienced outdoorsman, so authorities believe he's been hiding out somewhere in the mountains, which honestly sounds exhausting for a 73-year-old. Now, while most grandpas his age are worried about keeping their lawn nice or relaxing with a fishing rod, Grandpa Eugene is spending his last days in the jungle like some sort of Tarzan with a crime history. Samantha Luthwaite. If you thought women didn't have what it took to be hardened criminals, then you're in for a huge surprise because Samantha Luthwaite is out here proving
proving that she's no damsel in distress, but rather a damsel causing distress. At first glance, you'd think this woman should be hosting bake sales or organizing the perfect Christmas parties, but the reality is that she is actually one of the world's most wanted terrorists. Popularly known as the White Widow, and no, not the Marvel kind, Samantha Luthwaite is a mastermind behind Al-Shabaab, an extremist group in East Africa that basically trains and recruits women to become bombers. Talk about promoting gender equality. The White Widow would literally Waldo spend her time assisting and creating plots for different terrorist attacks, specifically across Kenya and Somalia. Her involvement in antics resulted in the death of over 400 people and the injury of millions more. Now, that's not a resume you want to boast about on LinkedIn. However, despite numerous sightings and being on the FBI watch list, the White Widow has managed to evade capture like she's got a lifetime supply of invisibility cloaks. Currently, she has a million dollar bounty on her head, but still, nobody has been able to actually give a proper explanation or direction as to her whereabouts. The Toy Car Killer as a kid, you were probably in love with Batman and Spider-Man and probably even fantasies of becoming a vigilante like them. But, well, as you grew up, that fantasy died with your childhood. Uh, but not according to a man who became popularly known as the Toy Car Killer. This particular guy operated in Mexico in 2019 and took on the job of personally dealing out punishment to car thieves. This guy had the weird ability to find people who think life is one big grand theft auto and would go through extreme measures to make your life a living hell before ultimately unaliving you. If you were a car thief during this period, the toy car killer would find you, cut off all your fingers and tongue, and then proceed to shoot you multiple times. After this, he would stage your body lying face down with the amount of cars you've stolen in your lifetime. Some of his victims were found with as many as 13 to 15 toy cars all systematically arranged on their dead corpses. Now, unlike other serial killers who follow specific routines, this guy switched it up. He didn't have a type or a fixed location for his attacks. One day it was in a park, the next day near a busy street. He was the wild card of killers, making it impossible for the police to predict his next moves. It was like trying to solve a puzzle with pieces that kept changing. To this day, nobody knows who this killer is, and all efforts made to catch him have not yielded any results. Some people actually believe he's some kind kind of hero, but the truth remains that he is a killer. Nemesio Oseguera Cervantes It all started in Mexico in the 1980s when Nemesio Oseguera Cervantes dropped out of primary school and illegally migrated to the United States in search of the American dream. Sadly, all he found was more like the American nightmare because he was caught, arrested several times, and finally deported to Mexico in the early 1990s. Now, back in Mexico, Nemesio decided that the best cause of action was to become an apprentice to one of the most gruesome drug cartels in the area. After years of servitude, he eventually climbed the criminal corporate ladder and became one of the biggest bosses for the Milenio Cartel. He eventually decided to go solo and founded the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, a cartel that specialized in brutal killings, torture, and evil crimes. These guys would make your average crime syndicate look like a kindergarten. As the head of this cartel, he tortured, murdered, and dismembered cartel rivals or anyone who dared stand in his way. After dismembering a body, he'd hang it from a bridge as a warning to anyone trying to mess up. It's like a horror movie scene, except it's tragically real. In one incident, Nemesio's cartel shot down a military helicopter with a rocket-propelled grenade, killing soldiers in an ambush that shocked even the hardened military forces in Mexico. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, has El Mencho on its most wanted list, offering a reward so significant that it could probably pay off a small country's debt. If you want to find out more about all the crazy things people have done and gotten away with, then you can start by joining our Discord server today. Arnoldo Jimenez. Now, the normal end to any wedding vow is the phrase, till death do us part, which is actually supposed to be a romantic gesture of your undying love and loyalty. Well, this guy, Arnaldo Jimenez, was not joking when he said his vows because he took them way too literally. It all started 
married in 2012 when Jimenez married his girlfriend Estrella Carrera, but instead of riding off into the sunset for their honeymoon, they decided to go party in a limo. Now that sounds very fun and spontaneous, but unfortunately the new bride Estrella was found dead in her bathtub still in her sparkly silver wedding dress with no sign of her husband. Apparently they had an argument on their wedding night, so in a fit of rage Jimenez ran to the kitchen, took a sharp knife, and stabbed her multiple times. But instead of leaving her to bleed on the floor, he dragged her to the bathroom and dumped her in the bathtub till she bled to death. Talk about cutting the honeymoon short. As for Jimenez, he didn't stick around for the who did it part. After the murder, he fled faster than a bad first date. A night that was supposed to be the happiest day of both of their lives suddenly turned into a horror movie freak show, and till today, the murderous groom has remained on the run. Vasilis Palios Costas. If you've ever read or watched movies based on Robin Hood, you can easily imagine the kind of criminal Vasilis Palios Costas was. Except instead of using arrows and robbing the rich like the fictional Robin Hood, Vasilis used guns and robbed banks. Vasilis Palios Costas began operating as a robber in the 1980s in Greece. After robbing banks, he'd give all the stolen money to poor families living in the rural part of Greece, a strategy that made Vasilis very difficult to catch because it was practically impossible to trace the stolen cash back to him. Because of his goodwill toward the poor, he won over the crowd and the guy practically became a folk hero in Greece, with people rooting for him like he's the underdog in a heist movie. They even started calling him the Greek Robin Hood. But like all good heist movie characters, the law caught up with him in 2006. He was tossed into a maximum security prison with a 25-year sentence, but Vasilis had no intention of staying locked up for that long. After five months in jail, his brother hired a helicopter, flew over to the prison, and literally airlifted Vasilis to freedom as if he were Tom Cruise in a Mission Impossible movie. Now you'd think he'd lay low after his prison break, but Vasilis went right back to his Robin Hood routine, dodging cops and throwing cash like confetti for two more years. He was basically Greece's most wanted party guest. Of course, he got caught again in 2008, but uh, like a guy with a helicopter loyalty card, he escaped again in 2009 with another helicopter. This time, though, he decided to hang up his Robin Hood tights and fully went into hiding. Sharon Kinney. Sharon Kinney wasn't your average 1960s housewife, unless your idea of average involves a gun, multiple murders, and a Houdini-level escape. Her crime spree began on March 19, 1960, when she decided that her husband needed a permanent nap and shot him in the head while he was sleeping. Naturally, when the authorities showed up, Sharon had a story ready. She blamed their two-year-old daughter for accidentally pulling the trigger while playing with the loaded gun. That's right, Sharon threw her two-year-old toddler under the bus. Despite the suspicious circumstances, Sharon got off with a shrug and a not guilty verdict. Besides, it's not like the toddler could talk to testify what had happened. The next year, Sharon started a romantic fling with a man named Walter Jones. But the problem was that Walter had a wife, Patricia Jones, and he would never leave her for Sharon no matter how badly she begged. So she decided to settle the love triangle the only way she knew how. One evening in 1962, Sharon lured Patricia to a dark alley, and using the same gun she had used on her husband, she shot Patricia first in the leg to cripple her from running away before pumping her chest full of bullets. She put the dead body in a body bag and dumped it in a trash bin. Unfortunately, Sharon didn't have a toddler to blame this time, and she was caught and arrested. However, while she was awaiting trial, she escaped to Mexico with the help of yet another lover. Now, you'd think Sharon would chill out after fleeing to another country, but she couldn't resist using that same gun again. This time, another lover of hers got her mad, so the only logical solution in her eyes was to shoot him. Shoot him right in the back. Later, she claimed it was self-defense because he tried to assault her, but Mexico wasn't having it, and she was sentenced to 13 years in a Mexican prison. She escaped from the prison in December 1969 and vanished into thin air. She had not been seen in 50 years. But Dresh Kumar Chitambai Patel. If you live in the U.S., you've probably seen a Dunkin' Donuts, or maybe even grabbed a cup of coffee and donuts to kickstart your morning. Well, in 2015, Badrish Kumar Chitanbhai Patel turned one of those donut havens into a real-life horror show. On the night of April 12, 2015, while working the night shift at a Dunkin' Donuts in Hanover, Maryland with his wife Palak, they got into a heated argument. Palak had suggested that they pack up and head back to India, but Patel was having none of it, so in a fit of rage, he turned his wife into a brief 
breathing, living punching bag. But just beating her unconscious wasn't enough, so he grabbed the kitchen knife and stabbed her multiple times in the stomach and chest before finally slicing her neck, leaving her to bleed and choke to death. He dropped the murder weapon on the floor and fled the scene without a trace. Authorities think he may have escaped to India or is being hidden by family or friends. Despite the FBI offering a $250,000 reward for information leading to his arrest, Patel has managed to dodge capture for years. Roberto Solis Roberto Solis is basically a real-life criminal mastermind who somehow turned his life into a mix of a heist movie, a poetry reading, and a disappearing act that would make any magician proud. Starting in the late 1950s, Roberto was dabbling in petty crimes like robbing stores, pickpocketing, and snatching purses. Small-time stuff, just enough to keep his criminal streak alive, but not quite enough to pay the rent. He soon realized you can't live the high life with a pickpocket salary, so he decided to upgrade his crime game. In 1969, he robbed an armored truck, but the heist went wrong, and he had to shoot the truck guard eight times in the head, chest, stomach, and legs just to escape. You see, his escape wasn't exactly a clean one, because he had left his fingerprints all over the crime scene like it was his personal business card. Two weeks later, he was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. But, of course, for a guy like Roberto, life in prison was more like a really long coffee break. While behind bars, he managed to rebrand himself as a poet, writing under the alias Pacho Aguilla, because apparently even hardened criminals need side hustles. And believe it or not, his poetry was so good that he gained a loyal fan base of supporters, who helped him get paroled in 1992. But instead of living out his parole with a quiet, peaceful life, Roberto did what any self-respecting criminal mastermind would do, he went right back to heists. This time he teamed up with his girlfriend, Heather Tallchief, and in 1993, they pulled off one of the biggest armored truck robberies in US history, stealing a cool $3.1 million in Las Vegas. Talk about upgrading your career. Heather eventually surrendered in 2005, probably because carrying around all that guilt and cash gets heavy. But as for Roberto, it's like his existence was practically wiped off the face of the earth. Glenn Stewart Godwin Glenn Stewart Godwin started out as your average small-time thief, but he decided to take his criminal resume to the next level in 1980 when he murdered a guy named Kim Lavallee. Apparently, Glenn and a buddy thought robbing Lavallee would be easy money, but things went sideways faster than you can say bad plan. So Glenn stabbed Lavallee multiple times, and just to add his own flair, he blew up the poor guy's body in the desert like it was a bad action movie. Shockingly, blowing someone up didn't help him avoid the law. Glenn was caught and sentenced to 26 years to life for murder. He was shipped off to Folsom Prison, a maximum security facility in California, a place he was determined not to stay very long. In 1987, Glenn got a little creative and literally dug his way to freedom through a storm drain system that was pretty much an underground labyrinth. After crawling through the muck, he popped out the other side, probably smelling like a combo of regret and sewage, and made a run for it. He fled to Mexico and picked up a new criminal hobby, drug trafficking. He was recaptured in 1991 for trafficking drugs and thrown into a Mexican prison. While locked up, he killed another inmate by strangling him to death just to earn some respect among the Mexican prison crowd. Fast forward to 1996, Glenn escaped the prison again like it's just a fun weekend activity and hasn't been seen since. He's now a professional fugitive with the FBI still scratching their heads over where he might be. Vitellome Innocent Now, Vitellome Innocent is one of those guys whose names is hilariously ironic because this guy is a million miles away from innocence. Vitellom is a Haitian gang leader and a certified nightmare for law enforcement. His infamous crime was back in 2021 when Vitellom and his gang, known as the 400 Mawozo, kidnapped 16 Americans and one Canadian in Haiti, all of whom were missionaries. The gang snatched them up at gunpoint and held them for ransom like they were living out some bad action movie plot. Vitellom demanded a cool $1 million per person and gave only 24 hours for the demands to be met. Naturally, the authorities didn't cough up the cash fast enough, so Vitell Ohm, never one to bluff, began executing the hostages in the most terrifying way possible. Gunshots to the head, throat slitting, strangulation, you name it. He even had the audacity to film the whole thing and send it to the cops like a twisted highlight reel. The executions only stopped once the gang got their payday, and the remaining missionaries were released. Aside from kidnapping, Vitell Ohm and his gang are also involved in armed robbery, extortion, murder, and drug trafficking. As of 
of today, Vitel Home and his crew are still running Haiti like they own the place, setting up roadblocks, getting into shootouts, and having the cops on speed dial. The authorities might be trying to stop him, but with the 400 Mowozo crew, it's like trying to put out a fire with a water gun. Alexander Solonik to be literally nicknamed Super Killer, you'd have to be an exceptionally deadly person, and Alexander Solonik was exactly that. He was the James Bond of the Russian world. He didn't wear tuxedos, but he carried out many assassinations. His career as a hitman kicked off after he was kicked out of the Soviet army for being a bit too enthusiastic about killing people. And as an ex-military, he was very experienced in martial arts and stealth and had great shooting skills. This guy could literally shoot with both hands at the same time and still hit his target. That's next level Denzel Washington. He also had a unique specialty of slipping out of tight situations, whether it was a shootout, a police ambush, or even prison. Yep, that's right, he escaped prison too, after he was sent to jail for allegedly harassing his ex-girlfriend sexually. Well, all his talents couldn't go to waste, so he was hired by the Russian mob boss as their go-to hitman. He was the one you'd call if you wanted any pesky rival to, well, disappear. The scariest part is that he always delivered on the job. It didn't matter if a hundred bodyguards surrounded the target. Solonik would slip in, take you out, and slip out as easily as you would take out your trash. Eventually, his years of killing high-profile people made him a target, too. Turns out when you become the go-to guy for taking out the top dogs, the smaller dogs wouldn't be so fond of you. With the target on his back, Solonik flees to Greece, where he tried to lay low, but in 1977, he was found strangled to death in his luxury villa. You'd think someone with such a bloodthirsty resume would be untouchable, but even the most ruthless killers have their day. Although, who actually took out the famous super killer still remains a mystery. It didn't bother anybody too much because it was just simple street justice with a sprinkle of karma served. Giuseppe Greco if you lived in Sicily in the 1980s and were unfortunate enough to be an enemy of the Sicilian Mafia, specifically the Corleonesi family, it's certain you'd be taken out by Giuseppe Greco, Sicily's most notorious hitman with a kill count of 300 people. Giuseppe Greco, also known as Pino Greco or Scarpuzzeda, which means little shoe, was born into a mafia family in Palermo, Sicily. So he was practically destined to become a criminal from day one. He climbed the ranks quickly thanks to his sharp aim and very enthusiastic work ethic when it came to killing. This guy wasn't just your average enforcer, he was like the Grim Reaper of Sicily, running around in his shiny shoes and leaving a trail of bodies in his wake. He had a reputation for being a bit of a perfectionist, so once he set his sights on a target, you could bet your last cannoli that he would get the job done. Now, during the Second Mafia War of the early 1980s, the Corleonesi family wanted to wipe out their rivals within the Sicilian Mafia completely. And who was the perfect killing machine to call when you plan to wipe out all your rivals? Well, Greco, of course. He performed excellently, but by 1985, Greco's high-profile killing sprees started to draw too much heat, which made his boss, Salvatore Rina, begin to get a little paranoid. So, in classic Mafia fashion, Greco was invited to a friendly meeting and then promptly shot dead. Not exactly the retirement party he'd hoped for, but hey, live by the gun, die by the gun. Thomas Patera Thomas Patera was the real-life equivalent of a character out of a drug mob boss movie. He was deadly, unpredictable, and had a bit too much love for the art of his work, which you can probably guess by now. You see, Patera was actually born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, but later traveled to Japan, which is where he learned karate. He was so good that he even got the nickname Tommy Karate, and when he got back to New York City, he joined the Banano crime family and became their hitman. What better way to put his karate skills to good use, right? Now, because he knew martial arts, this guy could slice and dice you with a katana just as easily as he could take you down with a gun. Picture a gangster who could roundhouse kick you into next week, then calmly adjust his jacket and walk away like nothing happened. 
He killed with a disturbing level of enthusiasm and creativity, and had a reputation for being particularly brutal. Instead of just shooting his victims in the head or chest, he'd take his time to torture them first, making sure to exact whatever twisted justice he thought was necessary. He didn't see murder as a job, he saw it as a passion project. And if he suspected anyone of knowing too much about his personal life, he'd kill you too, and that included friends and members of his crew. This guy was so crazy that once he entered a social club, everybody would turn to face him because nobody wanted to be backing Tommy Karate. Patera carried a special toolkit for cutting up bodies with the precision of a surgeon, and then he'd bury them in the Staten Island graveyard. He was single-handedly responsible for the murder of about 60 people, but thankfully his reign of terror came to an end in the early 1990s thanks to good old-fashioned FBI work. A series of informants led the authorities right to his doorstep after after they witnessed how insane the guy actually was. He was arrested and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, where he resides to this day. Gregory Scarpa So let's say you got kidnapped by a hitman who locked you in a dark, empty warehouse in some remote place and tortured you for several hours for information. After providing the information instead of letting you go as they promised, you were given a shovel to dig your own grave. Literally. This was exactly how Gregory Scarpa, aka the Grim Reaper, operated back in the 70s. He was the stuff of a nightmare for both the mob and the FBI. This guy lived up to his nickname, dealing out death with the casual ease of someone handing out business cards. While he was a capo in the Colombo crime family in Brooklyn, he also had a secret side hustle as an FBI informant, making him a double-crossing devil with a body count that can make a horror movie villain blush. So so when he's not racking up a kill count that would put some small town mortuaries out of business, he was feeding the feds with information about his rivals. It's like being a hall monitor who also sells cigarettes behind the gym. The feds even turned a blind eye to Scarpa's extracurricular activities because, hey, he was killing bad guys and helping them catch more bad guys. So it was basically a win-win, until it wasn't. Eventually, he managed to unalive a total of about 120 people, and this time, the feds just couldn't brush it under the rug. He was arrested in 1992 and was sentenced to life in prison. Well, that was the beginning of the end for the Grim Reaper because, in a very sick twist of fate, the guy died from AIDS in 1994 after contracting HIV from a contaminated blood transfusion. At least he also experienced torture and a slow, painful death, so a win is a win. Richard Kuklinski Richard Kuklinski was known as the Iceman, a nickname that came from his chilling ability to freeze the bodies of his victims to throw off investigators about the time of death. But the real reason behind his name was probably because he had a heart as cold as ice and an insatiable appetite for murder. Kuklinski was born in New Jersey and grew up in an abusive household that taught him early on that life was brutal and cruel. With this mindset, he committed his first murder as a teenager by beating a bully to death with a wooden pole. Talk about finding your calling early. Most kids that age are still trying to figure out algebra. By the time he was an adult, he had turned murder into a full-time job and became a freelance hitman for various mob families in New Jersey and New York. So if you cross the mob or owe them money, you'd want to pray to whatever deity you believed in that the Iceman wasn't the one sent to settle the score. He was a versatile and creative killer who would use anything within his means to unalive his victims. He punched, pistol-whipped, strangled, and even stomped on some of the victims to death while they slept. But his favorite method of killing is with cyanide because it is quick, efficient, and leaves little evidence. He often carried it around in a little spray bottle, casually spraying his victims as if he were freshening up their cologne. He didn't just stop at contract kills. He turned murder into a twisted science experiment, using homeless people as his unwilling lab rats. If there was a hitman equivalent of a research and development department, Kuklinski was it. Kuklinski is believed to have killed over 200 people but his downfall came in the mid-1980s, when an undercover operation caught him plotting a murder, leading to his arrest and conviction. He died in prison in 2006, unrepentant to the end. Giovanni Brusca if you think mafia hitmen are bad, Giovanni Brusco was the worst of the worst because this guy didn't just carry out hits, he orchestrated massacres, bombings, and even torture sessions. 
His path to becoming a hitman had already been carved into his destiny even before he was born because his father was a high-ranking member of the Cosa Nostra, a ruthless Sicilian mafia. So violence was practically coursing through his veins. By his 20s, he was already known for his brutal methods and no one was safe from him, even high-ranking government officials. His most notorious act was the 1992 assassination of anti-mafia judge Giovanni Falcone. He used a bomb weighing half a ton to blow up the judge's car, killing Falcone, his wife, and three bodyguards. Brusca also kidnapped an 11-year-old boy who was the son of a mafia informant. He kept the boy alive for two years before strangling him to death and dissolving him in acid, a gruesome message to anyone thinking of turning into a rat. Brusca is believed to have killed or ordered the deaths of over 150 people before he was finally nabbed by the Italian police in 1996 and sentenced to life in prison. Faced with a life behind bars, Brusca did the unthinkable. He turned informant, aka a rat, spilling the mafia's secrets to save his own skin, which is such a hypocritical and ironic thing to do because this guy spent his whole life looking for creative ways to kill rats. Well, his cooperation actually helped bring down several mafia bosses, proving that there was truly no honor among thieves. His sentence was reduced, and in 2021, Giovanni walked out of prison a free man to the joy of absolutely no one. Roy DeMio if, in the unfortunate event, you are on Roy DeMio's list, chances are you'd get a one-way ticket to the Gemini Lounge. And trust me, it wasn't for the drink specials. At this place, you'd be shot in the head and then stabbed in the heart to reduce blood flow before your body would be drained of any remaining blood in the bathtub. Finally, your dead body would be cut into pieces and parked in bags for disposal. This was Roy DeMio's step-by-step -step process to killing his victims. His attention to gory details detail caught the eye of the Gambino crime family. They were so impressed that they made him their go-to guy for making problems and people disappear. It was like having a deadly Houdini on speed dial. Together with his crew of merry murderers, Demio sent 200 souls to the great beyond. His victims ranged from enemies and rivals to even members of the Gambino organization that posed a threat to their operations. But as they say, live by the sword, die by the, uh, well, bullet in this case. Roy's bloodthirsty ways started to give the Gambino family and law enforcement a collective headache. He was drawing more attention than a neon sign in Times Square. In 1983, Demio's body was found in the trunk of a car riddled with bullets. The official story was that he was killed on the orders of his own boss, Paul Castellano, who saw DeMio as a liability. John Scalise You've probably heard of Al Capone, or at least read about him somewhere. He was one of America's most popular gangsters and boss of the Chicago Outfit crime family from 1925 to 1931. As with every crime boss, he also had his own right-hand killing machine, John Scalise. But unlike Capone, Scalise wasn't born into a world of crime. He was born in Sicily, but immigrated to the U.S. looking for the American dream. He ended up in organized crime. He later joined forces with Al Capone in the 1920s, becoming a key member of the Chicago outfit. So while Al Capone was the king of the Chicago underworld, Scalise was his executioner with a reputation for taking out enemies in the most ruthless way and without hesitation. Although Scalise had been involved in some of the most brutal kills of the time, his most notable kill was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929, where he gunned down seven members of a rival gang in cold blood. However, Scalise his loyalty to Capone began to waver when he started having ambitions of his own, one of which was to overthrow Capone. But being a crime boss, he caught wind of Scalise's plot and things took a turn. Capone, not exactly known for his forgiving nature, decided to nip this mutiny in the bud. So, in 1929, Scalise, along with fellow hitmen Albert Anselmi and Joseph Guinta, were invited to a feast supposedly in their honor. During the meal, Capone went full Gordon Ramsay on them, if Gordon Ramsay used a baseball bat instead of insults. They were beaten to death, ensuring they wouldn't be around to challenge his authority. While the exact number of people Scalise killed is unknown, it's believed he was responsible for dozens of murders, either directly or by orchestrating them. Join our Discord server today to get updates on all the exciting information you need.
Harry Strauss. Hitmen who lived in the early 20th century had guts larger than two African elephants put together. As if killing targets in broad daylight wasn't enough, Harry Strauss joined an organized crime group that was literally called Murder Incorporated. Talk about truth in advertising. He joined the group in the 1930s and quickly rose to the top as one of the most brutal and unpredictable killers in the mob. This earned him the nickname Pittsburgh Phil. Not because he was from Pittsburgh, but because the mob bosses thought it sounded intimidating and he practically lived up to it. When it came to killing people, Strauss was like a loose cannon with a penchant for violence. He killed with guns, ropes, his bare hands, and ice picks. He was highly skilled with the ice pick too because he could drive it through a victim's ear and into their brain without leaving a trace of blood. He had different inventive and terrifying methods of killing depending on whether it was for fun, profit, or just for the sake of killing. With a body count between 100 and 300, he made the Grim Reaper look like an underachiever. He was finally apprehended in 1940 when Murder Incorporated began to crumble under intense law enforcement pressure. He was charged with multiple murders, but true to his unpredictable nature, he pretended to be insane during his trial, hoping for an insanity defense. Well, it didn't work. A year later, Harry got a one-way ticket to the electric chair. He was executed in 1944 at Sing Sing Prison, probably disappointed that he couldn't add survived electrocution to his impressive resume of near death experiences. Julio Santana Julio Santana is considered one of the deadliest hitman in modern history, and is the man who puts the kill in skill. But unlike the mafia killers or the organized crime hitman of old, Julio was operating deep in the Brazilian jungle. With a chilling tally of over 492 confirmed kills, he was a contract killer whose job was less like a crime and more like a grim profession. Julio's career as a hitman began at the tender age of 17 when his uncle, a cop who decided to switch from protect and serve to shoot and collect, asked him to off a fisherman who had committed a heinous crime. Julio agreed, not for the thrill, but for a square meal. Talk about working for food. Most teens just flip burgers. After his first kill, Julio's life took a turn for the worse, or better, depending on your perspective on job security. His uncle, playing the world's worst career counselor, connected him with drug lords, corrupt politicians, and anyone who had cash to pay. His victims ranged from petty criminals to rival gang members and even innocent people caught up in someone's vendetta. Unlike your typical hitman who kills for kicks, Julio treated murder like a 9-to-5 job just so he could survive and provide for his family. He even kept a journal of his kills, complete with dates, locations, and even how he felt after a kill. Despite his deadly day job, Julio was more conflicted than a vegetarian at a barbecue. After each kill, he'd pray for forgiveness, torn between his religious upbringing and his role as the jungle's top terminator. He was like a lethal version of Hannah Montana, the best of both worlds, but with more bullets and less singing. Julio managed to dodge both bullets and handcuffs for decades, thanks to his ability to disappear into the wilderness faster than your dad on child support day. He was like a deadly version of Where's Waldo, except nobody wanted to find him. In the end, Julio hung up his hitman hat, not because of a close call, but because the weight of nearly 500 lives on his conscience was heavier than an anaconda after an oil you can eat buffet. He returned to his family seeking redemption and probably a really good therapist.